Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. According to Jung, nothing exerts a stronger psychic effect upon the human environment, and especially upon children, than the life which the parents have not lived. This week on the podcast, we're going to be exploring the effect of the unlived life of the parent on the child. We may find in ourselves ways that our parents' unlived lives have affected us, and we may become aware of how our unlived lives have affected our children. So we're going to be walking around this topic and exploring it from many different angles. And we all know how incredibly important the influence of parents is on adult children who come into our consulting rooms. And uh, one of the places that analysis and many psychotherapeutic uh, processes begin is with the past, uh, with your childhood. What was it like growing up? What happened to you? And that this is what is carried forward into adult life uh, from childhood and the influence of the parents. But I think we're talking not just about the influence of the parents and what the parents did, but we're talking about that negative space in the parent's life that the Mm -hmm. parent may not even be conscious of and likely isn't fully conscious of, that somehow the child absorbs and and maybe it's important that we sort of start right there and define what we mean when we talk about the unlived life. In some ways, I think this is so ubiquitous, it's easy to not notice in everyday life. For instance, we all have friends who have let us know that their moms always wanted to be a ballet dancer. And so all of a sudden, you know, little Lisa is being put into ballet classes at eight years old with a certain kind of driving intensity from the parent. And it's just accepted as a kind of parental decision, but the intensity underneath it and later reflection on it lets us know that in that situation, the mom is trying to vicariously experience something she did not attain through watching her daughter, for instance, be involved in ballet, whether or not the daughter really likes it, and sometimes, more traumatically, despite the fact that the daughter does not like it. I'm uh, reflecting on on what you've said, Joseph, but also going back and looping in what Lisa said about things that are more subtle than the overt desire of the parent to see her unlived ballet career uh, in her child. But those absent places or gaps, losses, griefs, 
uh, that are somehow so subtle that they don't even have a name, but are experienced uh, by the child. And I'm thinking about Jung and uh, how he experienced his father's disappointment in his father's career. His father was a pastor. And he had wonderful experiences with his father as a young child. And then when it came time for Jung to prepare for uh, taking communion, he realized he couldn't talk to his father about what was really going on. He finally says, you know, that he was disillusioned and even indignant for once more seized with pity for my father who had fallen victim basically to this uh, lack of meaning and lethargy, a spiritual lethargy in his life. Of what kinds of influences do those unspoken uh, parental lacunae have for children? What Jung could only realize later in life fully. And if you think about Jung's story, there's a way that his whole life was an attempt to fill that lacuna of his father of this sense of meaninglessness. And that is the great question that Jung took on. And so how much of that was in this very subtle way that you're talking about, Deb, this very unconscious way, the father's wound uh, Mm -hmm. kind of got transferred as an unanswered question to the son and then became his job to redeem that in a sense. When I think about this, I'm mulling over the ways that we communicate very subtly to the people around us, which I think was a Freudian perspective. So for Freud, the idea was that the ego would unconsciously and imaginatively insert a potential into the child, and then through highly specific and subtle behaviors, pressure the child to them come forward with the behavior or interest that had been stored in them. For Jung, because he posited this rather mystical unconscious to unconscious connection, there is a feeling of almost spiritual possession where the latent luminous images in the mind of the parent which are still below the threshold of awareness, actually insert themselves into the unconscious of the child through this unified field. And then they press upward in both the father, for instance, and the son, pressuring to move towards the actualization of the image. The difficulty, of course, is that the father in that moment can abandon his mission to tend to these images and internal pressures. And so this shows up as in the realm of projective identification, which I think happens all the time. But because the parents have such unfettered access to the child's psyche, and the child is so motivated to mirror and reflect the parent in order to be close, I think the parent-child dyad has much more power in that projective identification process. It's uh, actually really very sobering, uh, what you've just said, Joseph, the unconscious to unconscious connection uh, that Jung really articulated, how powerful that is, how powerful the need is of the child to attach to a parent and the parent's far, far greater power to influence the child unconsciously. And it it really places upon a a parent uh, an obligation to be as conscious as possible of what am I saying, what am I feeling, what am I doing, how am I influencing this child? 
But but you know, I want to complicate this a little bit because I, <laughs> oh good, <laughs> I I think it's first of all Im- impossible to be completely clean in any interaction, and perhaps especially with our children. So to think that we're not going to exert any kind of conscious or unconscious influence of our children, like that's just not attainable. And then there's the fact that having certain influence or or expectations of your children is actually can be a very good thing. I mean, parents, parents should influence their children. You know, I agree that it's important to be conscious of how we're doing it. But but the other thing is that just as just as the elder Jung's kind of lack of spiritual meaning set his son on a quest that defined him, and also allowed him to realize his talents and potential and leave the world with this just incredible body of work. Not every time that we find ourselves living out our parents' unlived life is an unmitigated disaster. (laughs) Probably part of the reason why I'm (laughs) sort of coming the defense of parents is because (laughs) with uh, (laughs) two young adult kids, I'm beginning to see the chickens come home to roost. So there's that. But I'm I'm also aware, you know, uh, when I was a kid... My mother, I would go off, my sister and I would go off to school and my mom would sit around, I suppose, after she'd, you know, done, done the things that moms do and she would read the collected works and many of my volumes of the collected works sitting on my bookshelf were belonged to my mother and have her copious notes in the margins and I, you know, did not become interested in Jung because my mother liked Jung. And in fact, I probably stayed away from it because it was her thing. I remember her, you know, reading Memories, Dreams, Reflections and telling me some of the the stories from it. I remember that as a pretty young kid. So, you know, I thought it was kind of cool, but it was like her thing and I was going to stay far away. And I was, you know, engaged in a very different kind of work in the world. And then I stumbled back into Jung at 28 uh, and it just kind of blew me away. But one of my first questions was like, oh, my God, am I just doing this because this was like my mom's thing? You know, and I was initially really concerned that I, I had this sort of contaminated motivation for being interested in this. But the truth is that, uh, yeah, in some sense, I probably am living out my mother's unlived life. I mean, she she never went into analysis. Um, I think she did consider it, but she just never worked up the courage to do it. But on the other hand, I, I think I also have a propensity uh, for it and, and an interest in it that probably comes very naturally because I'm my mother's daughter. I think your point is so well taken, Lisa, that uh, very few parents are perfect. Um, heaven only knows that. There is a way that this can work for us uh, a, and set us on a life course that in some way may redeem a parent or a parental complex uh, in a child, in an adult child. And, And there are other ways that these unspoken parental needs can be insidious and cripple an adult child. If you cannot leave home said as an unspoken need, you need to take care of me. Uh, I don't go out in the world. Uh, stay here and be with me. You know, and that's just sort of a broad brush descriptor of something that instead of in- incentivizing a child to go out, learn, live, keeps a child small, contained, and constrained. Well, I think that there's a difference between a parent offering a child a resource in the way that your mother made Jung's works available to you and a parent colonizing a child oh, in a sense a against their will. It. So it sounds like, Lisa, your mother demonstrated an interest in Jung. She made that available to you. You decided ultimately to try it out, and you had your own thoughts about what that would or would not mean. And yes, you ideally would have paid attention to it because your mother is shining on it and children are interested in what their parents shine on, at least to try it out. I think with the colonizing influence, there is a sense that what's happening in the parent is not, is not available. 
and is repressed. Right, it's unconscious. It's unconscious, and because it's repressed, it has a primitive dynamism to it. So it's not like it shows up in the child in its highest expression. It's vented by the child just to relieve the tension of the unlived life. And so often it doesn't come forward as elegantly as it did, for instance, in your situation. And often later in life, the child comes to the realization that something alien is being driven in them, alien to their own self. And if a child doesn't experience that way, then it's just a resource that was offered to them. Yes. And and I, I just want to clarify my concern about uh, whether or not I was living out something unconscious was not so much that I had this resource of having been uh, made familiar with Jung. It was more that she, I believe, considered taking this further and didn't for one reason or another. And uh, I don't I don't really know that whole story, but that was my fear that she had not realized something and therefore it had knocked around in the field between us and then landed in my life. Now, ultimately, by now, I obviously don't see it that way, but that was my concern uh, coming coming to this in my late 20s. So yeah, I think I think your points well taken, Joseph. It's what goes underground and then winds up landing in the life of the child with this uh, urgency to be realized that feels alien to who the child is. Exactly. And I think that when we're talking about this problematically, it's less often the unachieved goals of the parents and more often their shadow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, we might have an overly moralistic parent or parents who then wind up seeing a particularly libidinous or sensuously driven child, which is shocking to them because they've been trying to inculcate the child with this very rigid sense of how to live. And all of the unlived sensuality or sexuality or social experimentation that's repressed in the parents is is hot material. It's intense. And children pick up on that and become interested in it. Mm. So shadow versus unrealized goals, both of them undoubtedly influence children. But I suspect one is less conscious and more demonized than the other. One is kind of an ego ideal. The other is a shadow, yeah. Yeah, and but sometimes unrealized goals are unrealized because they've been pushed into the shadow. So I, I'm not, I, I like your focus on the shadow. And sometimes that can look like the thing I didn't allow myself to become. So here's a, another quote from Jung that unpacks it a little bit more. All the life which the parents could have lived but of which they thwarted themselves for artificial motives is passed on to the children in substitute form. That is to say, the children are driven unconsciously in a direction that is intended to compensate for everything that was left unfulfilled in the lives of their parents. Hence it is that excessively moral-minded parents have what are called unmoral children, or an irresponsible wastrel of a father has a son with a positively morbid amount of ambition, and so on. And that's from The Collected Works, Volume 17. It's a very um, tempting phrase in the beginning there. All the life which the parents could have lived, but of which they thwarted themselves for artificial motives. I think that's very interesting and passing it on to the children in a substitute form. So the parents themselves have lost their connection to self in this particular formulation that Jung is offering. And they have adopted, as he said, an artificial motive, perhaps something that the culture has determined, perhaps something that their own parents have determined for them, and that their own authentic sense of self their own authentic interests have been pushed down and pushed in. 
which makes it feel a little darker to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's a very clarifying quote. So, so the unlived life of the parent is a burden to the child. And, and I also think we can think about it that the unlived life of a parent sets a question to the child that the child then has to grapple with and somehow find some answer to. Well, and looking in literature for some of these examples, um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet. So Hamlet is the Prince of Denmark. His father, old Hamlet or King Hamlet has died. And his son is left in grief and confusion Hamlet has actually inherited the throne, but his father's uncle, Claudius, has risen up as a a more powerful politician and a full-grown man, has married his mother, Gertrude, and has set himself up as the king of Denmark. And as Hamlet is kind of moody and unsure and depressed, the ghost of his father begins to haunt him. I think that that's a really powerful example of the needs of the invisible father pressing upon Hamlet. And the thing that the father wants from Hamlet is revenge. That the father wants Hamlet to depose his uncle, wants him to punish, ostensibly even kill his uncle, And the great conflict that unfolds in the play is that Hamlet can't seem to find his way to agree with that, but feels agonizingly tortured by it as well. So one of the issues uh, that this really lifts up is that the unlived life of of a parent or what has been imposed on a child can appear as terrible ambivalence. Yes, I was just going to say that. Yes. Mm. Uh, Should I do it or should I not? Is this mine or did it come from someplace else? I don't even know. And uh, of course, this very famous Shakespearean play has been written about, about this, about the effect of that. So just a little exchange from Hamlet, which I think really speaks to this. So Hamlet comes across The ghost, and of course, is astounded. Hamlet says, speak, I'm bound to hear. And the ghost says, so art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. Hamlet innocently says, what? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast in fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burned and purged away. So I I think that's a powerful thing. Till the foul crimes, till the thing I cannot adapt to is burned and purged away. And I think that speaks really powerfully to the ambivalence in the parent that by unconsciously placing the unlived life in the child, it is a way of purging and purifying themselves of something which is not congruent with the way that the parent sees themselves. And I think that, that dynamic is, (laughs) it's very dark and uh, very problematic. And I, I have a, a story I'd like to share uh, related to exactly what you've been talking about. And, and going back to your point, Deb, I, I think it does, you know, one of the symptoms maybe of this is, might be this profound ambivalence and a feeling of stuckness or un- inability to move through something. I'm going to share a little um, clinical vignette, and I'm going to obscure the details, but I, I do want listeners to know that I do have this person's permission to share this story. A woman who is a mother and a very talented uh, woman, she's um, has talents in multiple domains, and uh, she's very accomplished. 
Uh, but one of the things that we've been working on together is that she feels a little stuck. She feels like there's a lot of creative energy, but it doesn't know where it wants to flow. And she has uh, achieved a, a, a significant amount herself, but she's also throughout her life at various times uh, given a lot of energy to helping other people fulfill their creative uh, desires. So she's been dealing with this frustration and it's been difficult to move through it. And then she brought in a dream recently and, and here's the dream. She says, I'm trying to find some space to be by myself, but when I go into one room, the kids are there. And when I go into another room, my mother's there. And my mother asks to borrow my phone and uh, she, she wants to call uh, Italy. And she makes this phone call to Italy and then she hands the phone back to me and all of a sudden everything in my phone is in Italian and I can't make any sense of it. I don't speak Italian. And I said, well, you know, tell me about your mom and Italian and Italy. And she said, oh, well, that's, that's really quite a tremendous story. So I come to learn that when her mother was a young woman, she had spent several years in Italy uh, studying uh, opera. She was a, a singer, and apparently she was quite a talented singer, and she um, studied with some uh, significant teachers, but ultimately she decided not to pursue that. She she set aside... Um, the, the study of Italian and the study of music. And she came back to the States and in very short order, she wound up marrying my client's father and giving birth to my client actually. So this woman who is now my analysand was, was born uh, sort of at this juncture in her mother's life when she was setting aside this other thing she could have been and she could have done. Now, and talking with my client about this, her mother is still kind of lives uh, with with a, a toehold in that other world. She she loves to talk about her time in Italy. She loves to listen to opera. She always has season tickets to the opera. She um, you know will kind of take any excuse to speak Italian or um, talk to her family about what it was like when she lived in Italy. So there's this, there's this quality of something that she set aside and, you know, maybe is still a bit of a, a sort of an unclosed wound that her daughter was literally born into this psychological moment of kind of sacrificing this other life and now here my client is uh, with with lots of talent and not sure where to put it or in service to what it should be used. And we really made this connection that the dream was pointing out that some of her inability to kind of find some time and space for herself may be that uh, her mother's unlived life is kind of I'm churning in the background in some sense. So I think both of us are, are really interested in that and how that's working in her life. So it sounds like the energy in the mother's psyche is taking up so much real estate in your analysis psyche that it competes for the limited amount of libido that any one person has, but also it creates an internal conflict about whether one should listen to oneself or whether one should listen to the inner parent and perhaps who is the internal authority? Is it something like that? Uh, perhaps. And I think that there is a sense that although, you know, my analysis mother seems like she's uh, had a very happy and fulfilled life being a parent, but clearly there's something also that didn't quite get answered or didn't quite get realized. And, and so is there a sense that that has somewhat been modeled for my analysis? And, and so somewhere in her psyche, it's not clear that she has permission to fully give herself to her creative abilities. So it's the general pattern of not championing one's true destiny is is modeled and then repeated or could be repeated 
in the attitudes of their children? Yeah, I think it's modeled. And then it's also like, how can she have permission to do it if her mother didn't Mm -hmm. give herself permission to do it? Right. right. Like, does she have the right to do it? Here's my hypothesis. I wonder if in my analysis and psyche, it feels like she couldn't possibly fully give herself permission to embrace her own creative potential when what her mother has done is split off some of that creative potential and let it live as this kind of attractive fantasy, kind of on the sidelines of life. Mm -hmm. I wonder if what this is pointing to is how we inherit psychically and emotionally our parents' complexes. Uh, that your client's mother's decision to forego her uh, operatic career and the ambivalence around that of uh, choosing to be married and raise a child, that very complex has been passed on to the daughter. Can she embrace her ambitions and her creative potential? Or, uh, as the dream sort of hints, um, is her family taking up all her psychic space. Right. So what the Analysand experiences is is that she's inherited the way that her mother held her goals. It's It's an attitude that was passed, an attitude towards the inner life or an attitude towards the discovery of one's potential. Yes. And the dream seems to be saying that somewhat mysteriously, the mother's unlived life is kind of jamming her potential, Mm -hmm. her her ability to get her voice out into the world because the phone comes back to her and it's unusable because it's been, to use your word, Joseph, it's been colonized by this language that my analysis doesn't speak. So I'm thinking about the therapeutic arc of that moment. So we introduce that potential, we introduce that interpretation to any client, that it seems like you have an agenda that you're running on that doesn't seem native to you. It doesn't seem like it's rising out of your own foundation, and yet it has so much power. And I'm imagining in my own practice, the way that the analysand can feel like they are betraying the parents by challenging it or setting it aside that the parental complexes can punish the ego when it isn't being obedient in much the way that Hamlet's father's ghost haunts him and terrorizes him until he does this thing that the father wants, until he discharges the tension that the father is holding. I think that that's a good description. And I, and I want to just kind of go back to, you mentioned Hamlet again, the way that it just creates this ambivalence and it seems to make it difficult to move forward in our lives. It's like we're dragging some dead weight behind us or something. So ambivalence um, is really very big in the psyche uh, and in the consulting room. And Hamlet certainly portrays it, but it seems like a fairly innocuous word, I think, at first. So I think I just want to uh, land a 10-pound weight on it. Then I think, you know, speaking of the therapeutic arc, what has to happen is that that child, the adult child, simply has to deal with his or her psychic inheritance. And what Jung says about that is, no matter how much the parents and grandparents may have sinned against the child, the man or woman who is really adult will accept these sins as his or her own condition, which has to be reckoned with. And in that way, I think we can best redeem the sins, so to speak, of of our parents who are human and are imperfect, as are we all, but it's up to us to work on our own internal landscape and ambivalences and 
see what we can do about it. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate that perspective so much, Deb. And I like the phrase that you used of psychic inheritance, because the truth is we all have one. Yep. Right? We don't get to adulthood with, you know, sort of neutral, because there's no such thing as kind of, you know, completely clean interactions with one another. We're, we're in this relational field all the time. And so, yes, we have a psychic inheritance that came from our parents. And I think even comes from the ancestors in ways we're often not aware of. And then there's the question of, okay, so what do we do with that inheritance? And and if you think about it, I mean, actually what's coming to mind is the the fairy tale Puss in Boots, because um, I think it involves a miller who has three sons and he doesn't have a lot to give away when he dies. And one son gets the mill and another son gets something else. And the youngest son gets a cat <laughs> in a <laughs> pair of boots. And it's like, okay, what do I, what do I do with that? You know, that's my psychic inheritance. I mean, if you, if you think about it sort of literally, you know, what do your parents leave you? And then what, what, what do you do with that? And uh, it, that's kind of your responsibility is what you do with it. And that's why I like this, this formulation that I suggested earlier, that it sort of sets us a question, but then it's us, up to us to figure out how we are going to answer it. So there's a, a shift of attitude that, that all of us have to take, that it's so important to accept that what's inside the psyche is truly ours. However it got in there, whether it was a mistake or whether it was purposeful, whether we like it or we don't like it, that we are the thing that must be acted on instead of constantly trying to act on our parents in order to change something or to fantasize about the parents in some way or pressure them or complain about them. That when we take ourselves in our own hand and say that Puss in Boots is my burden, and I have to figure out what I'm going to do about this. I think that's an enormous moment in most psychotherapeutic processes, that it's all in me. The price of refusal is so high. Yes. Of if we cannot, sometimes through no fault of the person's own, but the consequences of not being able to take ourselves in our own hands is so terribly high. And uh, what, what I'm thinking about is um, the story of the Minotaur. Uh, the Minotaur, as I think probably most of you know out there, was a monster who was born with a bull's head and a human body because his mother had uh, copulated with this white bull belonging to her husband, the king, who had been given this white bull by the god Poseidon uh, in order to help him win the kingship of Crete. That happened, and Minos, the king, was supposed to sacrifice the bull to Poseidon in, in gratitude, couldn't bear to do that. He just had come to uh, admire this beautiful creature so much. And so his wife, Pasiphae, was um, imbued uh, with a passion for this bull. And then as a result, uh, bore the monster child known as the Minotaur, who rampaged around the kingdom, devouring people, and finally had to be imprisoned underground in the famous labyrinth that uh, Daedalus, the master craftsman, had built. Finally, this uh, monster was slain by the hero Theseus after devouring some number of young Greek youths. But uh, there is the price of something that was visited upon this offspring through no fault of his own, could not be born, could not be dealt with, and resulted in just disaster. I think that's so powerful, Deb, the idea that the thing that must be sacrificed, that is kept behind, that is made too precious, then haunts the individual and haunts the family. Mm -hmm. Well, I can think of innumerable examples of the thing that one failed to sacrifice or that one's 
um, ancestors failed to sacrifice and keeps tumbling mm. down through the psyches of the individuals. And one of the things that I think is alcoholism. Mm. I think about the, the love of being intoxicated, the compelling nature of being intoxicated. And if that is not adequately sacrificed when one is participating in a family and, and having children, that unnatural love and preciousness around alcohol or substances like that tumbles down into the other family members or is at risk of doing that and producing these kind of aberrant monstrosities of thought and impulse mm. like the minotaur why am i attracted to this or that which makes no sense and is injurious to me or highly dangerous or grotesque where is that coming from this monstrous part of myself so then it begs a question of you know can we make the sacrifice that our ancestors could not mm. or what do we have to sacrifice that our ancestors could not which of course includes our parents yeah and what needs to be sacrificed right what needs to be sacrificed or even what needs to be claimed, though, too, because I think there are things, sometimes it works in a similar way when a parent or an ancestor couldn't claim something, and that tumbles down through the generations. You know, I'm thinking of the fairy tale Rapunzel, because uh, Rapunzel unspools in 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 the following way that that when the the woman is pregnant she has this kind of insatiable craving for a rampion you know deb's comment was it was the first kale craze <laughs> um, but it grows in the witch's garden and so it is uh, her husband steals it from the witch's garden and when the witch discovers this she asks you know that she demands that uh the child be given to her and so and so that's what happens. Rapunzel is destined to live part of her life locked away in the tower because of her mother's insatiable appetites. What might that look like in a psychotherapeutic moment, do you think? Uh, what comes up for me first and foremost, and it's not for the first time um, in our discussion this week, is this profound sadness about what can be visited on a child through no fault whatsoever uh, that belongs to that child. And I think that's what it looks like often, first and foremost, in the consulting room, is finding the tears, finding the grief that this happened to you. So the ability to objectify this thing that's moving around inside of us to recognize its alienness, but also the suffering and pain that it has caused mm -hmm. and to be able to soften its grip on us through tears, through grieving and grieving does have a softening, a melting down power, doesn't it? Yeah, but I like what you said, Joseph, about uh, objectifying it, which is uh, to be able to name it, to be able to articulate it, and that often it is the thing that is, it is known, but it is not been rendered into thought. It has not been rendered into words. There have not been the words to say it, and when that can be identified and described, of, then it can be grieved and softened, and we can begin to separate from it. And that grieving is a kind of sacrificing, because initially the defenses inside of us want to protect all that content, even though it's damaging us. So to be able to subject it to the feelings of loss and grief and suffering is a way of acknowledging that it has to be let go, that it can't constantly be renovated and revivified. 
because grieving is a way of letting go. We grieve the loss of somebody who's passed away. It's a process of letting the old image of who or what that person was and allowing it to melt, allowing it to change, to adapt to the new reality, which is, for instance, that our friend has passed away. So I think, I think there is something really essential in the grieving versus the hiding of something. So this shows up in literature in a lot of different ways, and I'm drawn to think about Oedipus. And one of the things that isn't well known in the Oedipus cycle is that Oedipus's father, Laos, had fallen in love with a young man who was the son of Pelops. He abducted this young man and raped him. And Pelos was enraged and cursed Laos. And that curse of the sin of the father eventually played out in Oedipus, killing his father and marrying his mother. This other kind of violent abduction of another person's life tumbles down into uh, the next generation. But the feeling is that Laos abducts, rapes the young man, and then flees back to Thebes as if it hadn't happened. And there isn't a kind of reckoning and grieving process that seems to be happening. There isn't a sense that Laos has uh, committed a crime, a, a sense of appropriate response to what has been done. And the secret keeping of that plays a part in its propagation. Right. That's the unlived life part of it. That's just what I was the thinking. The unlived grief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and the secret. It, it's We just ignore it. We bury it. Just like the Minotaur was buried in the labyrinth of take, take your sins, don't acknowledge them, hide them away, where they continue to live and exert their influence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Laos demonstrates that behavior in the story because an oracle of Apollo tells him that if he ever has a son, that that son will grow up and kill him. And so once again, Laos gives birth to a son and then tries to hide the son, tries to take him, pin his ankles together and leave him to die of exposure on the mountainside, to put it away, to get it away from him, to flee from the prophecy. And that fleeing is ultimately what causes his death because Oedipus is raised by a shepherd and Oedipus doesn't know that that's his father when they have this conflict at the crossroads and in this fit of rage strikes out at his father who he doesn't know and kills him. So again, the secretiveness of it creates a kind of poisonous context and I'm still on your uh, question, Joseph, of what does this look like in the consulting room? Well, it looks like instead of hiding from or burying or denying these secrets, psychologically speaking, uh, we become curious about them. We go toward them. We dare to encounter them. And to take on some part of our fate consciously, we could say that Laos' sin was also the attempt to defy the gods by trying to evade Apollo's prophecy. So there is a fatedness inside of ourselves regarding what we must encounter so that the soul can become what it needs to be. And there's a way when we thwart that that it creates a kind of tension in us that influences all the people around us. And again, particularly our children who are kind of drinking in everything that we are exuding. So there's a lot of kind of painful dynamics that we've been talking about. But I thought that we should also invoke the spirit of how this could be handled correctly. I have come to love a poem by Khalil Gibran, and it's from his uh, book, The Prophet, and it goes like this. 
And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, Speak to us of children. And he said, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth, the archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. That's, that's beautiful. And perhaps that's a place to switch to a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from, from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. It's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Mm. Today's dreamer is a man, 22 years old, who works in environmental work and is a student. And here's the dream. I am in what seems to be a decrepit apartment building, and I get the sense that the rooms of the building are interconnected and continuous. There are emaciated animals roaming the rooms. There are two figures astride from aside from myself, a large grotesque man sitting at a dining table and a tired-looking baker. The grotesque man seems to demand food, and the baker brings him cake and other food. The large man begins eating like an animal with his bare hands, throwing scraps behind him, resulting in the animals fighting over them. In a climax from the door leading to the other rooms, I can hear the sounds of hundreds of footsteps and the screams of children running toward the door into the room. The dream ends just as hundreds of hands begin to pass the threshold of the door. For significant context, our dreamer adds that he just moved into a new house and he's renting it with friends and that he's coming from an environment where he did feel restrained and heavily depressed. The main feelings in the dream were fear, a deep hunger, and panic. 
and he adds that the only interaction I had in the dream was briefly interact, entering a storeroom with the baker to fetch food, that he had taken extra food to give to some of the animals before delivering the food to the man, and that the baker wore an expression of deep sadness. So I'm struck by how apropos this dream is to our topic. That's exactly my feeling. I'm just struck by the emaciated animals, which to me would suggest this tremendous alienation from the instinctive level of the psyche and that cutting off of access to the instincts has caused them to starve, but they are not dead, even though they're diminished and suffering. Their grotesque, gluttonous male figure suggests some part of the psyche that is taking more than its fair share of the life force of the individual. And at the end of the dream, there seems to be a medicine, which is this uprising of legitimate need that the hundreds of footsteps and the cries of the children, that there's this release of need that's just barreling uh, into the room, barreling through the doors so unlike the animals that have to tolerate being fed scraps, something young and vital inside of him decides to breach the tower, breach the fortress, and start taking the things that it needs. And even though it may seem violent or apocalyptic at the end, it seems to me that that's quite correctly what needs to happen. Yeah, uh, I think that's so uh, insightful and well said, and that this large, grotesque man who is basically gobbling up all the food may be a parental complex, uh, and it's offset by our the image of the baker uh, who is generative and providing and even feeds the animals. I agree with all of that. And there's a way that when I see images like this in dreams, I wonder, uh, there's like an inverted sense of entitlement, or rather, maybe it's more accurate to say that all of the kind of healthy entitlement that we need to get our needs met in life has gone into the unconscious. And so it's it's really kind of driving us from within. And, you know, what we know from this dreamer is that he says he's been heavily depressed. And often when we're depressed, we don't have access to a kind of uh, healthy aggression and entitlement. And we can be very passive. And I there's something about the figure of the baker. Uh, what does he say? He says, um, oh, he's tired looking. And uh, it seems that the dream ego may be kind of allied a little bit with the baker, or I imagine that the baker is closer to consciousness, but there's some kind of duality here between the tired baker and the grotesque man. They're working as a kind of dynamic uh, duo in the psyche somehow. Uh, there's a kind of energy exchange between them that is out of balance, and Joseph, I, th I think your point about the kids coming in at the end, you know, that could be the healthy upwelling of aggression and entitlement that needs to make its way into consciousness. And the redistribution of energy. Versus the greedy uh, and grotesque man uh, who cannot get enough to eat, that that's an expression of need that is, you know, not legitimate versus all the young energy of these children. I'm, I'm also really interested in sort of the archetypal uh, potential here in the image of the baker uh, and the alliance that the dream ego has with the baker. I mean, what do bakers do? Uh, they, it's a transformative, miraculous process of taking uh, flour, water, yeast, and transforming it into the staff of life, that the substance that really can feed oneself. I'm thinking about this feeding theme, which of course you brought up wonderfully, Deb, there's the grotesque man that is possessed by the need to be fed. 
there's the emaciated animals that are also perhaps dying of hunger, that the spirit of hunger seems to be everywhere. And starvation is one of the you know, horsemen of the apocalypse, I believe, this kind of deprivation. Mm. And even though the baker represents some attempt to salve the spirit of hunger and gluttony, that it's unable to, to actualize fully enough to ever meet this need. And that the overwhelming hunger of the grotesque man makes it impossible for the psyche to feel compassionate towards the animal in him. So I would also think the dream is confronting him to be able to ask this fellow, what is the insatiable need that seems to be driving you and depriving the larger psychic environment, environment of the needed resources in order to lift your depression, in order to be able to feel vibrant in the world? And of course, we don't know that. He doesn't tell us in the context Although there is some hope that he's moving into a new house that he's rented with friends and he's leaving an environment where he felt restrained and heavily depressed. So there's a possible liberation, which also seems to be happening at the end of the dream in this kind of revolution. It's like a French revolution happening. Here at the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've broken out of the, of the prison. The Bastille day has arrived. And I, I'm also, I think I might also, uh, really envision a way to dream the dream forward um, because I think the grotesque man and, and all of this uh, setting of the dream with the animals and the children, it's a, really a great representation of this complex and that there is now the potential to, of differentiating it from the baker versus the uh, grotesque man, and that the ego in waking life, this young man himself, can ally with his inner baker and differentiate from the grotesque man. The, the complex itself has been lifted up now. It has an image and can be worked with so that ego and the shadow figure of the baker can work together to feed what needs to be legitimately fed uh, and isolate the grotesque, insatiable man who, you know, as they say out there, can't get enough of what he really doesn't need. There's a beautiful differentiation here from the complex. It is. It, and it gives a starting place to objectify it. I'm thinking about this idea of the neurotic need, that the grotesque man keeps thinking that he needs these baked goods, and obviously his body doesn't need it, and it's also not actually feeding the parts of the psyche which are starving. So this can also be something that we come to at 22, is we've, we often have to choose what college we're going to go to when we're 18 and choose a major. We don't really know who we are yet or what's going to satisfy our soul. So we can wind up in our 20s realizing that I am constantly ingesting you know, these things in my life and none of it's actually nurturing me. And so what am I going to do with this unmet hunger? And that's a sobering place to be in one's life, to to question whether or not we need a major life redirection based on what we thought was important when we were quite young. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.